Good morning and namaste to all of you. A very pleasant morning once again to begin this conference on consciousness, experience, and ways of knowing perspectives from science, philosophy, and the arts. I request Dr. Kasturi Rangan, who is the Director of National Institute of Advanced Studies, to begin with the opening remarks and welcome Dr. Rangan. Dr. Sangeeta Menon, Professor Srikantan, all the distinguished participants to this uh, two-day national conference on consciousness, experience, and ways of knowing perspectives from science, philosophy, and arts. Let me join Dr. Sangeeta Menon in welcoming all of you to this uh, conference. NIAS, of course, I'm sure most of you know, have been organizing this kind of uh, conferences, workshops, and uh, discussion sessions on the, in the area of consciousness. In fact, uh, the last time, one of the discussions they brought out in the form of a proceedings, and um, that is uh, Professor Srikant and Professor Narasimha, Dr. Sangeeta Menon, and many others were involved in the preparation of this uh, proceedings, and it seems to have really interested many in the field and even outside the field. So it is appropriate, timely for a one more conference because of the type of response it is drawing to do. And NIAS with its interdisciplinary character obviously is a place where one could hold these discussions because one have one has people in the area of science, philosophy and arts. And of course, it's also the place where many people come over and discuss these matters from outside too. Along with nanotechnology, biotechnology, and information technology, brain studies is considered to revolutionize human experience in the coming decades. The last few decades have seen tremendous achievements in not only creating new technologies and theories to understand life, nature, and universe, but also have brought back the human factor into discussions like never before. Consciousness studies is one area that has emerged as a significant one in bringing disciplines together and redefining the basic questions we ask with an emphasis on the role of experience. Today, the significant role of interdisciplinarity in understanding the various facets of human mind and brain encourages scholars to sit together and churn the foundational structures of their questions and methods. The limits of ways of knowing seem to extend with new insights into the complex nature of human mind. The divide between the two cultures is no more a definite and rigid one. The erstwhile strict quantitative neural approaches today give significant place for more qualitative ideas on agency, memory, aesthetic experience, and so on. Sometime back in his famous rate lectures to the BBC, the noted neuroscientist with Dr. Vilayanur S. Ramachandran, director of the Center for Brain and Cognition at the University of California in San Diego, said that the solution to the problem of aesthetics lies in a more thorough understanding of the connections between the 30 visual centers in your brain and the emotional limbic structures. According to him, once we have achieved a clear understanding of these two connections, we will be closer to bridging the huge gulf that separates CP's nose, two cultures, science on the one hand, arts, philosophy, and humanities on the other. Of course, yesterday, I understand from Dr. Sangeeta Menon, there was a very special program in the National Geographic Discovery Channel uh, about, again, Bilyano Ramachandran coming and trying to explain some of these concepts. With more of these connections getting a clear place in the way we present knowledge systems, we could be at the dawning of a new age where specialization becomes old-fashioned 
and a new 21st century version of the renaissance man is born the theory of emergence emphasizes that the phenomenon of emergent order deals with organization with the higher levels showing new properties that are not evident at the lower levels the unique properties and behavior of complex systems arise from how the facts are arranged and interact these proper properties cannot be fully explained by breaking the order down to its components parts considering this inherent non reducibility how do we understand a complex phenomenon like consciousness and subjective experiences what is complexity this two day conference will present varied approaches to understand appreciate and learn the from basic human experiences with focus on specific theories of knowledge and method the questions and issues that will be raised will include the nature of reality according to science in the light of understanding consciousness the neurobiology of memory the theory and experience of rasa and beauty in indian aesthetics consciousness and cognitive anomalies brain and meditative experiences the importance of experience in the world of science etc in fact uh, it's a very interesting series of lectures that are planned in fact the synopsis of many of these talks itself give us a flavor of the type of things that are going to take place both today and tomorrow i welcome all of you to this exciting conference on consciousness experience and ways of knowing i thank eminent scholars who have come here from and outside bangalore and agreed to speak to all of us i am sure that this conference would be a very fruitful one and interesting one and in sangeeta's words let a million ideas bloom but i would like to cut down the million to a thousand being a scientist thank you yes uh, a philosopher sees it in millions and a space scientist of course would like to see in thousands <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rankin, for those uh, very appropriate opening remarks. Uh, I'll take only a few minutes. Uh, uh, you would, by now, from the email correspondences and our personal communications, would have got a rough idea of what this conference is all about. Uh, uh, but still, I wish to say a few lines. Uh, today, uh, the issue that gathers focus often, in spite of its evasive nature, in discussions on consciousness cognition or even advancements in nanotechnology and biotechnology is experience with a capital e the last few decades have seen tremendous achievements in not only creating new technologies and theories to understand life nature and universe but also have brought back the human factor into uh, into discussions consciousness studies is one area that has emerged a significant one in bringing disciplines together as well as posing the challenge of the binding problem of subjective experiences the puzzle how neural discrete and qualitative processes give rise to consciousness that is subjective unitary and qualitative has expanded the domain of consciousness studies to include as many different forms of human experience and ways of knowing do experience and the way we understand have significant roles in altering our ideas about consciousness this is one question which we would explore in this two day conference According to Thomas Kuhn the late historian and philosopher of science much of what we learn including science is by example when we learn by example we learn how to do something not necessarily knowing everything that is involved in doing it Michael Polanyi termed this kind of knowing tacit knowledge where we do not fully know what it is that we know so is knowledge tentative and related to how far we extend our paradigms is the concept of what is knowledge quite different in the sciences humanities and arts what is the role of experience in influencing knowledge systems these questions will be recurring in the today and tomorrow another uh, interesting phenomenon is about the theory of emergence and con considering the inherent non reducibility in theory of emergence how do we understand a complex phenomenon for example like consciousness and subjective experience what is complexity 
This confer conference will address the persistent puzzles and attempted solutions in consciousness studies, development in cognitive sciences, and the distinct ways of knowing and experiencing in science, philosophy, and the arts in the context of the Indian discourse. It's hoped that this discussion will help to examine the emerging trends in these areas and also explore the place of experience in knowledge systems. Today and tomorrow, we have exciting discussions and presentations that will begin in a short while with the presentation on science, reality, and consciousness by Professor B.V. Srikantan, which will be followed by the lecture on consciousness and cognitive anomalies by the noted parapsychologist and researcher in consciousness studies, Professor Ramakrishna Rao. Under the lecture on intention imprinted electrical device, experiments of William Tiller, introduced by Dr. M. Srinivasan. Uh, a lecture on the conscious bacterium by Professor S. Mahadevan from Indian Institute of Science. Sumandra Chatterjee will speak on the conscious versus the subconscious, a view through the neurobiology of memory. Ron Letchard was supposed to speak on mental awareness in Indian spirituality, but uh, um, unfortunately, he was down with a mild stroke, and uh, he will not be able to join us in these two discussions. And he wanted me to convey his apologies to all of you, so I do that too. Shadavadani R. Ganesha, noted Sanskritist and Indologist, will speak on the theory and experience of rasa. Dr. Runikrishnan will speak on denying experience in the physical world, consciousness misled. Professor Nadraja Sharma will speak on death and the foundations of science. And uh, Professor R. L. Kapoor on living at the edge of experience, the way of the sannyasi. Professor Narayanan Srinivasan on meditation, brain, and cognition. Uh, then we have a special lecture by Dr. Mrinalini Sara, by the noted uh, dancer and entologist. She will speak on the concept of beauty in Indian aesthetics. She couldn't join us this morning, but uh, she will be joining us uh, tomorrow. And uh, there's also a lecture by Dr. Sharada Srinivasan on the art and archaeometallurgy of Nadaraja bronzes. She would like to explore this into visual metaphors and consciousness. And apart from these lectures, we have poster presentations by Shruti Bajal, Farah Nas, uh, and Dilip Atreya from uh, the Center for Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences, uh, Sharad Chandra from uh, Hyderabad University Center for English and uh, Foreign Languages, and uh, yes, I think that's the, and, uh, uh, and we, Irina Narayanan from IIT Kanpur on Consciousness, Self, and Metaphor. The conference will end with a panel discussion on the theme of this con conference itself, and we would like to see what emerges at the end of these two days, though we wouldn't like to say that everything is concluded, but we still would like to leave these two days with an open mind. Uh, we would also like uh, to have some minutes devoted for uh, hearing at least a brief introduction from the many registered participants, almost 80 registered participants we have, not only from Bangalore, traveling from Chennai, Bang uh, Mumbai, Delhi. So very thankful to all of them to take the trouble to come here. So at some point, we would like to hear from them too. Uh, perhaps we will devote some time in the afternoon, but that we will discuss uh, a little while after this. So let's not waste any moment now. Uh, to begin with, it is uh, Professor B. V. Srikantan to speak on science, reality, and consciousness, and this will be chaired by Dr. C. S. Unnikrishnan, who will introduce to you Professor Srikantan. Dr. C. S. Unnikrishnan, I have known him for a few years now, and everybody tells me that he is one of the most brilliant physicists in this country. He is uh, pres presently a professor of physics at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Uh, he also visiting faculty positions at Center for Philosophy and Foundations of Science, New Delhi, Bhaktivedanta Institute, Ecole Normale Supérieure, Paris, and University of Paris. There are many more which uh, I think about Unikrishnan and all the rest of the people whom you would find in this booklet. So let me now request uh, Dr. Unikrishnan to chair this session and uh, Professor Srikantan to give the first lecture. Dr. Unikrishnan, Professor Srikantan. Uh, Professor Srikandan would be talking about science, reality, and consciousness. Science is constructed out of the interaction between the physical reality which we believe objectively exists and the human consciousness, and then projecting it back into the physical world. Professor Srikandan has been interested in 
questions related to foundational aspects of sciences for quite some time, back when he was uh, at AIFR as director there and later here in NIAS for a long time, and has been inspiring some of such studies right here in NIAS. So he has uh, original thoughts on these issues, and uh, we will hear some of those, those thoughts in his lecture now. Process reconduct. Professor Dr. Sangeeta Manan said, let a million ideas bloom. And um, a realist, Dr. Kasuri Rangan said, 1,000 uh, is enough. I feel that even if one new, I'm a hard-boiled realist, so even if one new idea blooms, I think the purpose of this conference is more than satisfied. So as uh, Unikrishnan said, that uh, science Not working. Science is the basis of many things, and most of us are familiar with the technology which is being used and misused for the benefit or uh, destruction of uh, human beings. But there's a more important and perhaps uh, uh, the original purpose of science was essentially to understand what is happening around us, how to interpret them in terms of uh, as few hypotheses as possible. Knowledge, for the sake of knowledge, was the old aim of science. And uh, all the applications came in spite of pursuing science only from that point of view. Now, uh, this particular one I have shown several times. This is the definition that uh, Charles Towns, the Nobel laureate, has given of science. This was given in 90, just a few years back. Science is the attempt to understand the structure of the universe and how it works, including ourselves. Religion is the attempt to understand the purpose and meaning of the universe, including our lives. Of course, George Bernard Shaw always is uh, his own way of saying, science is always wrong. It never solves a problem without raising more problems. And uh, Popper, who is also very familiar to all of you, science is a process of problem solving and explanation seeking. I think it's not focused. So with this definition of science and these uh, three aspects, which I told you, one is purely for the sake of uh, knowledge, for the sake of knowledge, and the other goes into technology and applications, etc. I'm going to concentrate essentially on what uh, science has done about uh, explanation of the universe. The universe, this uh, slide, summarizes the whole of the universe, the whole of sciences, everything. That's why it's a favorite slide of mine. This essentially is what, oh, I'm sorry. What the structure of the universe is today, you see there a man sitting and contemplating on what has happened all the time before. And according to our current ideas of the creation of the universe and the way the universe has developed, it's all pictured in this. If you also go into the details of it, I have no time for that, you will find every act that has taken place in this last uh, 30, 10 to 15 million years, a billion years. Now it is uh, fixed at 13.6 billion years as the uh, origin of the universe. Then you see there, all that has happened. But the reason why I'm bringing this is that if you go back in time and what they ask, and ask the question, what the universe was, 
it is very different from what it is today. Today it is, uh, there are so many billions of people on the earth. There was a time when there was no human being on the earth. There was a time when there was no life on the earth. But, and then you can go on and then there, even the earth was not there for some five billion years ago. So if you ask for the question, what is really reality? Then you have to say, immediately ask the question, what are you referring to? At what point of time you are asking the question, what is reality? Because reality itself, in a sense, has changed. Unless you define reality in such a way that is something that is there which doesn't change. In fact, a favorite definition of many is reality is something that does not change. That means there is something, we want something to be there, it doesn't change. That becomes reality. So uh, what is it that we are asking when you ask the question, what is reality? Reality, you know, is at various levels. Because uh, as students of science, we know, or even using common sense, reality is different at different levels. Particularly in the reductionistic approach, you can see for a chemist, it is enough to know up to about molecules or so. And nothing beyond molecules is relevant for him. He can do all his chemistry, and the biologist also can go up to the molecules, stop there, and then essentially do 90 to 95% of his biology. For him, he does not have to bother anything beyond. But on the other hand, if you go to a physicist, he has to go into further down and ask, worry about atoms, the structure of the atoms, the nuclei, and then structure of nuclei, the structure of fundamental particles, and so on. So even the question of reality is a question of for whom and who is addressing that question. It is not something which is the same for everybody. So philosophically, you may say that there is only one kind of reality, that is absolute reality. The question is, what is absolute reality? Is there one? And if it is so, what is the use of it as far as we are concerned? Supposing there is something which is uh, there and which you can't access, which you can't describe, and which we don't know when it was created, then the question is, what is the use of it from any point of view, excepting from the point of view of one who just wants to know the ultimate truth, basically. That is, for again, for the sake of knowing it. It has absolutely no use as far as uh, many of us are concerned in the normal life, nor in the academic life. So the point I'm trying to stress is that even the question of reality is a matter of for what purpose you are asking. Now, uh, there are various ways of approaching this question. Now, let us uh, take a simple example of uh, looking at a, say, a rose flower. Now, if you look at a rose flower, then you say that uh, when I look at it, two kinds of things happen. One is what happens in the mind. That is, there is a distinct perception and recognition of the flower. Then, of course, immediately you recognize its smell, color, softness, symmetry, beauty of the flower. And then, you, if it is a rose, you may recall some uh, associations with uh, something happening somewhere. For me, for example, if I went to Chandigarh, I see the beautiful rose garden. Immediately when I see a rose, that comes into my mind. That means memory is immediately triggered. Now, the question is, how does all this happen? Now, what is the scientist's explanation for it? Because I'm talking about science and, uh, see, consciousness is what has operated here, as, uh, uh, on this side of it. What you might call it mind, you might call it consciousness. But what is it? And the scientist wants to relate all this to activity of the brain. What is it that is registered in the brain? What happens in the brain is, first, the retinal image activity is activated, the rods and cones in the eye, and then generation of action potentials. These are electrical potentials that are triggered there. They are all of practically the same duration or the same amplitude, etc. But depending upon what the scenario is, what uh, the details are, the relative frequency of uh, triggering changes, action potentials are triggered, and these potentials are transferred.
transmitted through the millions of neurons that are there to particular areas of the cortices of the brain. Visual cortex is where the vision is connected with the visual cortex. So, the millions of uh, neurons that are there are connected from the eye to that point. And then what happens there? In passing through each single neuron, the pulse has to encounter enormous amount of obstructions. It has to go through what are called synapses. In the synapses, the electrical signal stops, then a neurotransmitter chemical is released, and again this neurotransmitter chemical passes through some distance in the synapse, and again whether it sh the pulse should be sent forward or stopped there is decided by other neurons that are there by the side. So all the command as to what should happen in each synapse is determined not only by that particular neuron, but also by the associated neurons in the neighborhood. And sometimes it is quite far off also. And then finally, something goes, the electrical signals, bundle of electrical signals go to the cortex and there some more neurotransmitter chemicals are released. That is all that we know from all the developments in neurosciences. Finally, you have got to relate the release of these neurotransmitter chemicals and these electrical pulses to what we call here on this side, like the softness of the petal or the color of the flower or smell of the flower. These are the qualities that uh, we are familiar with. That's the answer to which we want. You know, all that we are finding is some kind of correlations. That, that means this kind of signal in this particular area of the brain can release this particular, somehow is responsible for this particular sensation. This is the kind of answer that we are getting with all the new equipment that one has, the various kinds of tomographs, the various kinds of uh, scanning instruments that are there, the laser uh, in, uh, instruments and so on. Finally, what is happening is we are trying to find out, and in fact, it is not surprising, this is what is happening in the whole of science. You establish correlations of one thing with something else. For example, you use mathematical symbols in your equations and you relate them to what is happening elsewhere. And then you work on the mathematical symbols. For example, if you want to study the planetary motions, you reduce them to the equations of uh, Newton and then you see, and you work out the consequences and then you can, you can predict. Again, you work through the symbols. In fact, for the sake of mathematics, you can even represent the entire sun by one point and the entire earth by another point. But then you do the mathematics. So mathematics takes over the functioning of prediction and things like that. You completely lose sight of what is happening physically there. You just can't, and it becomes much more complicated when you go into more subtle phenomena which you encounter in the field of uh, quantum mechanics, which you encounter when the particles are very high, then you find detailed description of events, even physical description of events becomes meaningless. For example, in the case of radioactivity, the nucleus, the alpha particle is inside the nucleus and later on it is outside. You have recorded the registration of an alpha particle outside, but there is no way you can construct the trajectory of the alpha particle. So what is happening is as science advances, then you find that uh, the whole of science becomes one of a representation of uh, one set of quantities to another set of quantities. The, of course, see this is all from the point of view of applications and I'm not decrying the achievements of science in terms of all that has happened. All I'm saying is this whole question of understanding the matter, you really have to understand, you have to really break it up and say, what is it I'm trying to understand? All, and what is it that science is doing? You find everywhere, it's a question of transforming one set of representations to another set of representations. And this is where the consciousness plays an extremely important role. Actually, as uh, uh, this illustrates, you can see that Ultimately, it is consciousness that is transforming those uh, signals there into something that is qualitative, basically. Without consciousness, when you are unconscious, none of these you uh, appreciate. There is no smell, there is no color, there is nothing absolutely. That is where consciousness plays the role. At least this is my uh, point of view. Now, 
I would like to um, spend some time projecting the ideas of uh, great scientists, some, all of them practically Nobel laureates, on some of these issues. See, Einstein says matter when we perceive is merely nothing but a great concentration of energy in very small regions. We may therefore regard matter as being constituted as a space in which the field is extremely intense. Field is the only reality. See, we start with very concrete matter. We think we understand what that matter is, and that matter is converted into various forms. But ultimately, if you want the reality, that's what we are looking for. And that reality, according to Einstein, is just field is the only reality. But what is the field? You just can't imagine it, because you can only give a mathematical definition of the field, because there is no longer any physical entity you can say this is field. It's the, uh, the, actually the whole role reverses. You start now thinking of matter in terms of uh, field, and it's, uh, then Dirac says all matter is created out of some imperceptible substratum, which is nothingness according to him. This point I will emphasize that nothingness is what uh, ultimately we call quantum mechanical vacuum, because all the reality that is there is only quantum mechanical vacuum and fluctuations of it, either spontaneous fluctuations or something that you bring about by deposition of energy is responsible for all the creation. So that nothingness is unimaginable naturally and undetectable, but it is a peculiar form of nothingness out of which all matter is created. So ultimately, you are coming to a situation where the, uh, what you thought you would be able to concretize, you are ending up. Weinberg says, at the present level of understanding, they seem to be all elementary quantum fields. They are highly simple because they are governed by symmetries. These are not objects which we are familiar. In fact, our ordinary intuitive notions of space, time, causation, substance, and so on, really lose meaning on that scale. So we started out looking for these things. We want causes. We want to know something much more substantial. But we end up in things which we have to only postulate. And I'll, uh, this one is uh, brought out a little more clearly by this famous scientist David Bohm. Unfortunately, he died uh, reasonably young. To his amazement, Bohm found, this is a very beautiful example. It, to his amazement, Bohm, Bohm found that once they were in a plasma, electrons stopped behaving like individuals and started behaving as if they were part of a larger and interconnected whole. Although their individual movements appeared random, vast numbers of electrons were able to produce effects that were surprisingly well organized. Like some amoeboid creature, the plasma constantly regenerated itself and enclosed all impurities in a wall in the same way that uh, biological organisms might encase a foreign substance in a cyst. Now the point here is, this brings up another important aspect of the way things happen. That means individual behavior and collective behavior are very different. You can't on the basis of individual behavior predict what is going to happen collectively. As a matter of fact, this whole field of emergence, which is uh, today becoming one of the important areas of investigation, is just that, that you cannot predict what happens when, in a, see, in as much as in social sciences, you can't predict a crowd behavior by studying individuals. Even in science, what is happening is an individual, uh, this is what you call coherence effects and then emergence, and th which for many phenomena are happening because of uh, the collection of many individuals. So the, what uh, Bohm is saying that even electrons lose their identity once they are in company of uh, other electrons. And you can't predict that. This is the uh, unfortunate thing. Now let us uh, 
spend some time on what uh, some others have said. When a physicist looks at uh, quantum reality or relativistic reality, he is not looking at things in themselves, at noumenon, at direct and non-mediated reality. Rather, the physicist is looking at nothing but a set of abstract differential equations, not a reality itself, but a mathematical symbol of reality. Heisenberg says, it's important to realize while the behavior of smallest particles cannot be described unambiguously in ordinary language, the language of mathematics is still adequate for a clear-cut account of what is going on. But the question really is, is that the kind of reality we are looking for? Schrodinger, you know, the author of the famous book which triggered off many scientists to become biologists, the scientific picture of the world around me is very deficient. It gives a lot of information, puts all our experience in a magnificently consistent order, but is ghastly silent about all and sundry that is really near to our heart. That, that really mattered to us. It cannot tell us a word about red and blue, bitter and sweet, physical pain and physical delight. It knows nothing of a beautiful and ugly, good or bad, nothing of beautiful or ugly, good and or bad, God and eternity. Science sometimes pretends to answer questions in that domain, but answers are very often so silly that we are not inclined to take them seriously. So in brief, We do not belong to this material world that science constructs for us. We are not in it. We are outside it. Because this is the criterion of objectivity that you use in science. You, see. you want to, it to be not subjective. You take out subjectivity out of it and then try to explain everything in terms of what you call objective reality. And that is the reason why he thinks that you don't get the kind of answers to questions that you are asking. So in brief, we do not belong to this material world that science constructs for us. We are not in it, we are outside. We are only spectators. The reason why we believe that we are in it, that we belong to the picture, is because our bodies are in the picture. Our bodies belong to it. Not only my own body, But those of my friends, also of my dog and cat and house and all other uh, people and animals. And this is the only means of communicating with them. Moreover, my body is implied in quite a few of more interesting changes, movements that go on in this material world. And is implied in such a way that I feel myself partly the author of these goings on. But then comes the impasse this very embarrassing discovery of science that I'm not needed as an author. Within the scientific world picture, all these happenings take care of themselves. They are amply accounted for by direct energy interplay. Even the human body movements are its own, as Sherrington put it. The scientific world picture vouches a very complete understanding of all that happens. It makes a little too understandable. It allows you to imagine the total display as that of a mechanical clockwork, which for all that science knows, could go on just the same as if it does without there being consciousness. Will, endeavor, pain, delight, and the responsibility connected with it though they actually are. This is the kind of situation in which we are. We want answers to these questions, but science is not able to answer it. And the reason for this disconcerting situation is just this, that for the purpose of constructing the picture of the external world, we have used the great simplifying device 
of cutting our own personality out, removing it, hence it's gone, it has evaporated, it is ostensibly not needed. In particular, and most importantly, this is the reason why the worldview contains of itself no ethical values, no aesthetic values, not a word about our own ultimate scope or destination, no God if you please, whence I came, whither I go. Science cannot tell us a word about why music delights us or why and how an old song moves us to tears. Science, we believe, can in principle describe in full detail all that happens in the latter case, that is, why tears come to our eyes. In our sensorium and motorium, motorium, from the moment the waves of compression and dilatation reach our ear to the moment when certain glands secrete a salty fluid that emerges from our eyes, but of the feelings of delight and sorrow that accompany the process, science is ignorant and therefore reticent. But then I know there are people like Crick who tried to say, that is uh, more recently, this was uh, written by Schrodinger nearly 50 years ago, and uh, Crick came up with his uh, famous hypothesis that um, all our joys, all our sorrow, etc., is nothing but a the neurons uh, being activated. There is nothing else other than the play of neurons which are responsible for all the emotions, for everything. He wrote that beautiful book for uh, the astonishing hypothesis. The hypothesis was that nothing else other than the activity of the neurons to explain everything. After 265 pages, beautifully written uh, uh, book, he comes to a very strange conclusion that this hypothesis may be right, or it may be totally wrong, it may be some other religious explanation, or something else. So you can see that uh, there is no doubt that a lot of effort is going on in the field of science, particularly in the field of neurosciences, in understanding many of the intricacies of life, and the intricacies of consciousness, the intricacies of uh, the ultimate, uh, to find out what the ultimate realities are. But you find, ultimately, ended up, you are ending up in a situation where the, they are not giving the type of answers that you would like to have for the very fundamental questions. The, um, in fact, uh, Schrodinger himself finally comes to the, uh, why am because uh, there are so many other scientists who have said the similar things. But then he asked this question that, uh, when I do something, even if I lift my finger like this, there is a will on my part which is responsible for it. You cannot say it is just the atoms in my brain that are responsible for, uh, because that is my direct experience, that there is a will that I experience in everything that I do. And it's not just the play of uh, the atoms in my body, kind of. Uh, then we ask the question, how do you, what is this I that is there? When I say I do it, I will, etc. The question is, what is this I? And this I, finally, which uh, what we call the self uh, in our own uh, this thing. What um, I'll stop here after this uh, thing because I would have elaborated on what the Indian uh, thinking is on this whole thing. But what Schrodinger says is the only possible inference from these two facts, I think. I, in the widest meaning of the word, that is to say, every conscious mind that ever said or felt, I am the person, if any, who controls the motion of atoms according to the laws of nature. In itself, this insight is not new. The earliest records date back to some 2,500 years or more from the early great Upanishads, the recognition, Atman equals Brahman, the personal self equals the omnipresent, all comprehending eternal self was an Indian thought considered far from being blasphemous to represent the quintessence of deepest insights into the happenings of the world. So, to the, you see, Schrodinger came to this conclusion 
nearly 50 to 60 years ago, long before the developments that have taken place in all the sciences. In fact, in the last 50, 60 years, the developments in science are fantastic. There's absolutely no question about it. But none of the developments, as far as I can make out, has made any dent in changing the final outcome of the conclusions to which some of these uh, uh, scholars of, uh, say, pre-1950 days. In fact, I have quotations from Eddington, from Max Planck, from most of them are Nobel laureates who have written on this subject, who became kind of mystics. The reason for their becoming mystics is to be understood. They are all, after all, scientists who really developed science. They were driven to some kind of mysticism because in their uh, serious attempts at understanding what is happening, they ended up being mystics, saying, throwing up their hands and saying that uh, in the ultimate, uh, as far as the ultimate reality is concerned, see, you have to say that there, there is something beyond science. In fact, uh, as the director referred to, we had a conference here, an international conference a couple of years ago on science and beyond to discuss some of the implications of this. So it looks to me that uh, while science is certainly contributing quite a lot to our stream of knowledge, we should not forget that science is one of the many streams that are there. Science is just one of the streams that contributes to the knowledge, and science has been, uh, of course, of great value in improving the, uh, in so many respects, for example, the average life of an Indian has gone up from 30 years to 70 years or so, and uh, you can straight away attribute it to the benefits of uh, um, science. There's no question about it. But at the same time, when you ask the question, and it's particularly relevant in a conference like this, when you're looking for ultimate uh, realities and uh, insights and so on, we have to keep our minds very open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Srikandan. Uh, we'll have a discussion for about seven minutes now. So if somebody wants to ask a question, comment, they're welcome to do so now. You see, If you use the word God, many get upset. But if you use the word nature there, that there is an intelligence, nature controls everything. You see, that is what uh, Einstein calls, uh, it called cosmic religion. What Einstein comes to the conclusion, in fact, I don't know that I have said there, that there, there has to be, it just cannot happen, that uh, just by uh, random chaos, ra just randomness and chaos operating, all this can happen. What he says is there is a cosmic intelligence. But that cosmic intelligence, you may, should make a difference from, between uh, personal God and the cosmic intelligence. Cosmic intelligence is not going to be influenced by your prayers, by your particular faith and things like that. It operates in as much as if you ask the question how the laws of nature operate, you see, you have no explanation for it. It has to be uh, somehow, there has to be something to implement those uh, laws operating. Laws you can discern, but there is also the operational aspect of the laws. Okay. So um, ultimately he comes to a conclusion that there is a cosmic intelligence which you cannot, uh, that's why he calls it uh, uh, his own cosmic religion as he calls it. But he also doesn't believe in the presence of a personal God to whom you can pray, you can, uh, you know, who, whom you can influence to give you particular favors. Professor Pashupati. I, I uh, just, so, just one second. To me, even if you assume that there is this cosmic intelligence, impersonal factor, it may be built into it that your prayers, in other words, your thinking, can change or initiate changes in the very process 
of that so-called cosmic uh, principle, cosmic intelligence. And therefore, the individual wishes, the prayers of the individuals need not be irrelevant. They may be built into the very system itself because the system itself might respond to individual aspirations, individual wishes, individual prayers. Yeah, I mean, my point, I just represented what Einstein's views are on this question of there being a cosmic, he did not believe in a personal God. He, he makes it absolutely clear. But at the same time, like uh, Spinoza, he believes in a cosmic intelligence. That's the answer to Ramchandra, I'm saying. That, uh, in fact, I, I don't uh, disagree with you. Because what you said uh, is also possible. But if there's a cosmic intelligence, it can operate in various ways. Professor Pashupati. I'd like to take a position that uh, free will is an illusion. I want to say three things in this connection. Whether you're dealing with classical physics or quantum physics, both are causal in the sense that if you're given the condition at time t equal to something, at much later times, everything is uniquely determined by the equations of physics. So in some sense that you, and uh, I think Spinoza took the point of view that what you call as free will is really comes from the fact that they really don't know all the initial condition and what is happening in the various equations and so whatever you're going to do now is actually determined by the equations of physics, and therefore you think you're doing something by free will. It is really not true. I mean, it is an illusion. And maybe I quote from Bhagavad Gita, if you like, you remember towards the conclusion. Krishna tells Arjuna, well, boy, I have told you everything here, but you're like a fellow who is going around on a Ferris wheel. You think you're doing out of your own volition. That is simply is not true, because everything is determined by me. No, that, uh, that uh, I think there is good reason to believe that free will is really an illusion. It is not there. No, it's a question of what you mean by free will. It is, you see, free will is in our experience. Each one of us, you can always describe something in terms of unknowable. Uh, see, what you have to say is, I don't know how it happens, but it happens. The action of atoms is responsible for it. But my concept of free will is, I'm exercising it all the time. I'm not answering your question because of the will yeah, okay. to answer it. So I, you cannot, you see, I ultimately you can say physically what is happening is something, as uh, Professor pointed out, if there's a cosmic intelligence which operates through free will, there is one other answer way of looking at it. But uh, actually what is happening physically, it is true that it is the movement of uh, certain things that are responsible for everything. That is our scientific way of looking at things. But how these movements are controlled, whether they are controlled or not, other than the forces that we postulate and then the forces that we can envisage in terms of our physical uh, is another. Uh, Question here. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so to what extent um, are we justified in trying to uh, understand a complex phenomena in terms of its, uh, you know, constituent parts? Let's say if we try to understand behavior only in terms of the, uh, uh, let's say, the neural activity. Okay. Uh, to what extent are we justified, and what would you comment about the so-called, I mean, explanatory gap? That uh, I mean, there is always certain uh, aspects which cannot be kind of reduced. You know, to uh, uh, let's say the interaction uh, of of the neurons. Yeah, you see, what is the methodology of science? You see, methodology of science is to understand it in terms of uh, you know recording certain things, constituents, and then the forces that you can think of. What kind of uh, are the see? That's the way you proceed. No, that is there is no other way of uh, uh, approaching it scientifically. You see, there may be alternative methods. For example, somebody may say, I will understand it by just uh, contemplation. I just uh, understand it by meditation. You see, th those are different uh, things from science. So what I'm talking about is the scientific method that we are familiar. I'm not saying the other is unscientific or something like that. But the scientific methodology that we have adopted so far in the field of science is by the method of uh, trying to correlate one thing to the other and trying to find out what is the cause, what is the effect. Up to the level we can do it, but beyond that we cannot. I mean, we find one of the beautiful things about science, or the, it may not be desirable uh, that the science has limitations. Because you end up in a situation where, either because of the fact that you don't have the right, now, for example, in the last 50 years, 
the advent of uh, all these uh, kinds of instruments, the tomographic instruments, etc., has given us much more insight into what is happening inside the brain, inside the neurons. Individual neurons also they are able to study and this is the power of technology. But ultimately it has not given the answer, that's all I'm trying to say. When you go to the question of uh, ultimate realities or ultimate truths, you find that uh, science is in an impasse. Can I ask one? Um, uh, I, I'd just like to ask you, uh, in, in, in uh, Popper and Eccles, uh, the self and its brain, uh, there are two positions that are taken. One is uh, that of kind of uh, a deterministic evolution. Uh, I mean, given the laws of nature, I mean, uh, it was predetermined that human beings would come into this earth and uh, have consciousness and so on. But uh, there are other aspects, for example, uh, you know, uh, probability, you know, ch uh, chance, uncertainty, which, which makes the evolution of a system uh, somewhat contingent on, uh, yeah, you know, different aspects. So uh, what would be your analysis or uh, co comment on this? Is probability you know, just our ignorance I, or is it objective? As far as I have understood, both of them, you know, have not been able to answer all the questions. Both are open, basically. Whatever approach you take, finally, you're not getting a right answer. I mean, what is your analysis or which one uh, would you uh, uh, kind of prefer at the, you know, uh, given state of knowledge? You see, this is not one on which personal uh, convictions matter. What matters is you analyze the two kinds of problems, the Popper's analysis of the three worlds and things like that, and then, uh, but my own feeling is that uh, it's all right to talk in terms of generalities. When you go into details of mechanisms, you find that there is no adequate answers you find. I mean, that, is the, that has been the problem with science also. Even with, you, you know the simple problem that we all use Newton's laws for, uh, but there's a question of, uh, for nearly 300 years, you see, we all assumed Newton's laws and then we did so many things. Without understanding the fundamental uh, question, how the force acted at a distance. See, when somebody asked Newton, he said, God only knows. So the, the point is, but at the same time, you can't question the, the validity of Newton's laws or the usefulness of Newton's laws. But you see, in, in our way to analyze these fundamental problems, the way we end up is whether we have reached a final answer. And in, my, in there, my contention has always been that science is a tentative affair. I mean, it's so in, in the case of many uh, fields of knowledge, but science in particular is prepared to change. That is the beauty of uh, science, that you cannot say that, look, uh, I have finally answered this question. It has not happened like that. Uh, okay, we are actually <laughs> over time. I, one more question, probably, since you raised the hand first. The rest can continue at the tea time, otherwise. Yeah, I will be happy to talk to you. Last question. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to know, is there any theory of uh, physics of consciousness? I mean, people like Roger Penrose have gone on record saying that you need a new physics to explain consciousness. Is there any scientists who have come up with physics for uh, consciousness studies? It's precisely what I have been saying. There is science is still very tentative. There are many ways of answering these questions. And uh, Penrose, he uh, has tried to answer by, in one way, bringing in the ideas of quantum mechanics, and then he even thinks that uh, the problem of uh, collapsing the wave function can be done by using some kind of a gravitational action and so on. These are all attempts that are being made, but the problems remain. There is no final answer to any of these questions. As far as I understand, I spent the last seven, eight years in trying to understand when there is a consistent explanation of consciousness in terms of uh, the physical principles that uh, we are aware of, that we, which is very useful in many other domains. But when it comes to a question of consciousness, you find that uh, the problems remain. The fundamental problem is this, how do you convert these electrical signals and neurotransmitters and uh, chemicals, etc., into an entirely different category? 
excepting by saying some kind of a representation theory. Look, this corresponds, if I have so many signals and if I release so many chemicals, then this particular sensation I get. But that is not an explanation of the type which we want. It may satisfy some people that, look, I have found the answer to your question of uh, crying, saying that when you cry, so many of these neurons are excited, so much of neurotransmitter chemicals are released. But is that enough for me? Is that the kind of, is that the kind of answer that I want? I find uh, uh, that is not there. And we don't even have an approach to it. The unfortunate thing is, but we should not give up. You see, what has happened many times is by pursuing, by persisting, you may finally strike at an answer that this may be the, of course, one, uh, all these, for example, in the question of uh, uh, Newton's problem, which I told you, all this now in the light of uh, reality is non-local, or if you think in terms of the quantum mechanical ways of explaining action at a distance in terms of virtual particles and things like that, you think that you have found some answer to it. But whether that is the kind of answer that will satisfy Newton, I don't know. Okay, I, I know that there are many people who want to ask questions. I apologize. I don't want to change uh, Sangeeta's good opinion about me <laughs> by allowing over time. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Srikant. Thank you very much, Professor Srikant. Uh, Thank you for all the questions. Now we break for tea and we come back at 11 to listen to yet another significant area on consciousness and cognitive anomalies from Professor K. Ramakrishna Rao.